to me out of the, the book of Genesis was the great message. What is the message of the families of Genesis? And we're going to look particularly at the four generations from Abraham through the sons of Jacob are, are where we're going to be focusing. And today, I hope to, uh, for us to look into the scriptures a little bit about uh, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons. And then tomorrow, I'd like for us to uh, draw from what we have gathered together and to identify what we want to see or what, what is there for us about the transmitting or the uh, giving to the next generation of family values. Family values. Have you heard that term any in the last three months? Family values? See a few smiles here. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard about family values, haven't we? That's a, that's a real uh, buzzword these days. Family values. And uh, one thing that disturbs me a little bit about the discussion about family values is that it's as if you either have family values or you don't have family values. But the fact is that everybody has values in their family. Powerful implications in not only in the immediate family, in the immediate context, but for generations to come. And so in this class we want to look at some of those family values and how to transmit those from generation to generation. Now, you're, you're looking at a guy here whose oldest child is 10 years old. One, one group, okay. Now, I'm not here so much as a teacher to teach you about this from a parent's perspective. But every one of us, in fact, how many of you grew up in a family? Everybody did. Okay, so we all grew up in a family and we all experienced the receiving of values from our parents. So we're all in the same boat there. We haven't all had children grow up. Some of you have, have children who have children. I know some of them. <laughs> and I'm really glad to have you here in the class today. Because what I want to do is to facilitate an opportunity for all of us to share with each other what we've learned both as children growing up in families and for some of you, for all of us, maybe as, uh, as parents of children, but for some of you as parents of children who are now adults who have children of their own. Maybe you can share with us some of the things, both your successes and, if you're willing, some of your failures. Some of the things that, looking back on it, maybe if you had it to do over, you'd say, you know, I, I think I'd do it this way instead of that way. And so I'm hoping that, that you will share with us today and tomorrow about that. But values, family values. You know, this process of transmitting values is not just an accidental process. It happens by a very important process. And uh, some of you, your families are grown, and so I'm assuming that, uh, that there is some interest, though, of yours in families and family values and, and whether a family has a legacy of faith or a legacy of faction. In fact, what I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to, to find out uh, why, as opposed to another class. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you were stuck inside the doors and they closed them and you said, hey, why not? I'll just stay in here. Uh, they have padded pews. I'll be here. Uh, but what, what do you hope? What are you looking for? What do you expect in a class with the title, Your Family Legacy? faith or faction. What do you what do you think? Who will be second? Nobody wants to be first. So who will be which is the very thing that everyone avoids with the play. And uh, it's part of the Christian life. And I've talked about being on that edge of commitment. And uh, when we suffer it drives us to God. 
and it's where we develop those values, and our life is what I see passing on. Okay. It involves talking about them, but certainly if it doesn't come out of my life. So uh, I think what you have, and, and, and let me just say this when you mentioned Lynn Anderson, <laughs> Bob Powell has just as much message as the next guy. Maybe not as many years involved. But <laughs> I'm praying will happen as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Someone else. Your family legacy, <coughs> faith or faction? What on earth could that mean? I have nine grandchildren, and I want, and I didn't know it was the uh, faith or faction, you know, mm -hmm. the suffering, but it all goes together. But I want to help encourage my children to have that. Okay. When, when you think of, let me ask another question here to kind of help you along in, in what you're thinking here, but uh, how many of you knew that that was the title that Lynn Anderson was not going to be speaking today? Did any of you? Oh yeah, a few of you knew that. Okay. <laughs> when you think of the word faction, what, what comes to mind? Disagreement. Disagreement? The opposite of harmony. The opposite of harmony? Tension, okay. Disharmony, yes. Division. Division, okay, okay. Are we talking about division uh, in official on the worldly side? I mean, like, uh, you can teach your kids um, your faith in the scripture. I think you have to teach them. They don't get it by sitting next to you. Um, you teach them that, and then they don't live that. So, like, are we talking about that kind of faction? Are we talking about within the okay, faction? faction. Yeah, see, and, and that's a very important point. A lot of times kids stay in the same home, but there really is division between them, isn't there? And a family of faith is one that is not divided and does not have uh, walls between. Anybody else? Faction. What do you think of? The things that have been mentioned? Disharmony? What, what was it that you said, the very first thing? I was trying to remember. Uh, disagreement. Disagreement, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, as we are looking today, we're going to be looking at some things, and I'm also going to be sharing a few things with you. See, I'm, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist with the state of Oregon. I graduated from Columbia here as a counseling major, and I may be, I haven't checked this with the registrar and everything, but I may be, I believe I am, the only counseling major here ever to have received the Bible Award at graduation, and which gives you a little bit of uh, my interest and my uh, perspective and, and where I'm coming from. Uh, <clears throat> and I also have been in continuous ministry uh, with the Central Church of Christ since I graduated in 1977. Uh, first as a youth minister, then they sent me two years to ACU to get a marriage and family therapy degree to come back and work with families and to provide family uh, counseling and marriage counseling to families in the Portland area as a ministry. And so this is where I'm coming from and, and throughout this whole time, this whole journey that I have taken of education and going through several years of my wife and I not being able to have children and having foster children and then adopting some children and then the Lord blessing us with a biological child uh, that was totally unexpected to us. Uh, <clears throat> so through all of those experiences, I've come to understand, and, and one thing that I always make a point of saying is that in all my studies of the different research uh, methods and information that has all been gathered in all of the exposure that have, I've had to that I have never found information that has been gathered through research to be in contradiction to the Word of God. Now some of the conclusions that the researchers draw 
are in contradiction to the Word of God. But the information itself that is gathered without explanation is not in contradiction to the Word of God. It confirms it. It confirms the need for families and the importance of families and the importance of parents in their children's lives and the importance of grandparents in their grandchildren and in their children's lives. So this is uh, something that is just really near to my heart and I want to share with you some of the research that has been done about how values are transmitted from one generation to the next. These may be things that you can share, uh, first of all, things that you can apply in your own lives if you have children at home, if you don't have children at home, things that you can share with your children or with families in your church in general. Another application that I'm hoping not only to our physical families, but to our spiritual family. What does this say about our spiritual family, the church, about the passing on of values and the values of faith or the values that lead to faction? So we're going to, uh, I'm going to share some, some steps in that with you, but let's get into the Word of God a little bit here, and let's, for a little while, we have about, uh, boy, probably about 15, 20 minutes here left today to look at some passages of Scripture that have to do with the families of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's sons. In Abraham, we, we hear about Abraham in, uh, these are all from the book of Genesis, but Stephen makes reference to Abraham in Acts the seventh chapter, and then for the remaining part will be uh, in the book of Genesis. What do you hear, what did I do with the pen? There it is. <laughs> I've got to find this thing. Oh, that isn't it. There it is. Okay. Now, some of you are going to remember the stories of Abraham. When you think of Abraham, what is one of the first things about Abraham in terms of his values that you think of? His faith? What, what was in, what's an example of that for you? Willingness to offer his son up in regard to ask him to do it. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to try to make this so we can see it here. Okay, something else about Abraham. Okay. Also having to do with his faith. What else? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Faith offered his son and left his home. What else do you think of with Abraham and his faith? He gave his nephew Lot the first choice. Okay, so he gave his nephew Lot first choice. Uh, what value would that indicate to you? So God, God will take care. Okay, unselfishness would be another value. What about when Abraham went to Egypt? Do you remember that story? When Abraham went to Egypt? I believe it's in about the uh, 13th chapter of Genesis where he went to Egypt and he told Sarah to do something. What did he tell Sarah to do? Say to say that she... Why, why did he say that? Lack of faith. Okay, so lack of faith. Lose his life. Lose his life. What, what would you say is a value of Abraham's from, from looking at that... Hmm? What do you think? 
maybe a couple of three values shown in that. Okay. So he's protective. Okay. So protective of Sarah, maybe? Maybe of himself. It's interesting that almost exactly the same thing happened a little later in his life, too. Do you remember that story with Abimelech, the Philistines? Pardon me? Almost exactly. Almost exactly a repeat performance. And then later Isaac did the same thing, didn't he? With Abimelech. I mean, it looks like Abimelech would have learned about these uh, uh, Semites. <laughs> uh, when they come in, boy, don't expect them. I mean, they start saying their wife, their sister, you got to be careful. Uh, but he also, I think, had a value of, it says, I wrote down protective here, and, and that's a value that we want to give to our children, isn't it? It wasn't just a selfish thing on his part. He knew that if his life was taken, he couldn't uh, do what God had uh, asked him to do. Okay. So it would interfere with his uh, doing God's will. So he knew that if his life was taken, he couldn't follow through on what God had called him to do. And, and this... He had that in mind all the time, more, more than selfish reasons. Well, it's, it's possible. It's possible that he may have had that in mind at the at the forefront of his mind. Anyone else? Yes. Did you have something? Okay, that's fine. Okay, what about uh, when Abraham was taking Lot up to the mountain? Let's uh, let's turn. I believe that's in Genesis the twentieth chapter. Isaac, excuse me, thank you. It's actually in the 22nd chapter. The 22nd chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 18. We read about Abraham taking Isaac up to the mountain. God came to Isaac. What do you, what do you see that Abraham said right there in verse 1? What was his response when God called to him? Here I am. He wasn't, uh, you know, looking around, looking under rocks or anything. So he said, here I am, God. And then God told him to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. What was Abraham's response to that? He did it. He did it. So what would that indicate to you as a value of Abraham's? Obedience. Obedience. Good, good. So we've got obedience. What else do you see in that story? You should look along there. He takes Isaac. Isaac asks him some questions as they're going up. What's Abraham's response to that? God will supply, pardon me, some other submission, a value of submission. Okay. On whose part were you thinking that it was submission? Okay. So on Abraham's part. What about as we're beginning to get a glimpse of Isaac here, what do we see in Isaac here? He's submitted. And we also see this value of obedience being carried on to the next generation, don't we? Yeah. What what for you really speaks to the faith that's being transmitted there? Here's a man that would give his son. You've never been in that position. It'd be easy to give your life to give your life to yourself. But that had to be the ultimate trust in God. Yeah, I mean, we have a situation here where we have a man who is 100 plus years old. Anybody here over 100? I don't think so. 
a hundred plus years old, he was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. For 25 years, I think it was 75 years old when he came to Canaan. And for 25 years, God had been telling him, you're going to have a son. And he had a son through Hagar, Ishmael. And God said, no, that's not the son I was talking about. I mean, you're going to have a son through Sarah. No, I'm 100 years old. Give me a break. And he said, no, you are going to have a son. And through that son, the world will be blessed. Your seed will be so numerous that you cannot count. They will be as numerous as the stars that you can't count. Okay? And now, just a few years after, we don't know exactly how many years after, the thought is anywhere from uh, somewhere around early adolescence up to 20 years of age. I've heard different uh, ideas about how old Isaac was at the time. But now, just a few years later, 12 to 20 years later, God says, now I want you to take that son that I told you that your descendants were going to be as numerous, and I want you to take him up and I want you to kill him. Whew. That took a lot of confidence in God for Abraham to leave his family and to go into Canaan. But it took unbelievable confidence in God to go this one step further. That's the reason why I believe he was not afraid of his life uh, when he had to Sarah to pose as a sister. <clears throat> because if he had been, he'd been willing to die then for God. Now he's given his own son. That's a greater sacrifice than giving himself. So it's a matter of faith on Abraham's part from start to finish. That, that may be one possibility, that he may have had that faith. But I, I think it's also really interesting in the Scriptures that the Scriptures don't pull punches about the characters in, in those pages, do they? They talk about their warts, and they talk about their glory. He had a comment. It reveals something about God. If it's true that Abraham was protecting his own skin, which... I always felt that. But how many times have we not given everything to God? And so it shows me what a great love in you. It keeps building you. It keeps allowing more trials and tests to come in until finally we can lay our life down and give our children to God. Yeah. Yeah, he... I don't know how to repeat that all for the video, but <laughs> uh, it, it's just incredible, isn't it? To think that God could allow us the privilege of growing in our faith. And I think that's a value too that we shouldn't overlook too quickly here in, in this process is the value of growth, development, becoming. God called Abraham. He stepped out. He stepped back a few times. But then he got right back on the track got move of believing God and his promises. Well, we're almost out of time here. So let's uh, jump up here to uh, Isaac as we look at the 26th chapter. Well, this is Isaac and Abimelech. I'd like for us to look, though, uh, at the 24th verse. Would somebody read the 24th verse, 26, 24 of Genesis? That night the, God, uh, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Okay. Every single person, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, had an experience with God didn't they? Abraham had several experiences with God. God came to Abraham on several occasions and said, I have brought you here. I'm going to give you this land. Here in 26, 24, he gives that promise to Isaac. In chapter 28, verses 13 through 22, he gives that promise to Jacob. What do we see about the values of these men as they have this experience with God? 
The Lord comes to them and speaks to them. What, how do they respond? Do they say, ah, I don't think so. I don't know. Huh? They, believe. they believed. The Lord said it. That settles it. You know, I've had trouble with this bumper sticker that says the Lord said it, or God said it. I can't remember. I think it says God said it. I believe it, and that settles it. I have trouble with that middle part. It's, it's almost like me believing it settles it. But that's not what settles it, is it? God said it. That settles it. Whether I believe it or not. And so, that's the way these men were. God said it. That settles it. Now, they slip back. You know, Isaac was uh, Abimelech. and uh, Abraham, his father has his little uh, struggles as well. But I want us to jump ahead before we're completely out of time here. Clear to the last chapter of Genesis. Because I think this there is one verse here uh, that talks about Joseph. And I just encourage you to look at the lives. If you have a chance later today, early tomorrow morning, to look at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Maybe just reflect on those lives and the faith and the values of those men as they encountered God in their daily lives. There's a verse in the 50th chapter of Genesis that I think speaks of the character of Joseph. This is a young man who got a dream, several dreams actually, early in his life as a uh, the speaker last hour was uh, commenting. Maybe he didn't do uh, a real wise job of creating a little bit of animosity and uh, competition and rivalry with his brothers. But then his brothers sell him off into slavery. Then he's sold into the house of Potiphar. He's doing a great job. The Lord is blessing him. He stands for a value which is... What, what, what value did he stand for? in the house of Potiphar with Potiphar's wife as she's trying to entice him chastity. chastity sexual morality values honesty integrity with with his master he says he's entrusted me with everything how could I do this to you or to him and so uh, then Potiphar puts him in prison then in prison and then what happens? The baker and the cupbearer have their dreams. You know, now Joseph maybe wasn't this way, but if that had been me, I'd have said, all right, I'm finally going to get out of this mess. You know, maybe I'll get a nice job in the kitchen there with the cupbearer, and uh, boy, what a deal. I'll, you know, maybe I'll influence, and that'll be great. But nothing happens. Nothing for two years. Now, in the scriptures, and this is something maybe that you've noticed a long time ago, but in the scriptures, two years takes up one sentence on the page. Has two years ever taken up one sentence in your life? <laughs> now, you know, as I get older, maybe for some who are even older than me here, maybe you think, oh, you know, that was between this and this. That was two years and, and like that. Because I notice that I've kind of looked at things that way. Like, I spent two years in Abilene, and I say, oh, yeah, that was my wilderness experience. And, uh, you know, that was two years of my life. And yet I don't always stop and struggle through and learn through those two years. Listen, in the dungeon. And then he's brought out, his brothers come, he recognizes them, they don't recognize him, he could take vengeance on them, he is the, most, the second most powerful man in the land. Then in chapter 50, his father is about to die. Isaac is about to die. Excuse me, this is after Jacob 
has died, not Isaac. I'm getting my uh, parents mixed up here, aren't I? Jacob has died, and his brothers are worried. Wouldn't you be worried if you sold your brother into slavery, and now he's the second most powerful man in the land, and your father's gone? So his brothers are worried. And Joseph says possibly one of the most profound things in Scripture to me for my personal life. In verse 19, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. What value does that speak to you that Joseph held? What value? Pardon me? Complete trust in God? Forgiveness? Anyone else? What value did Joseph hold here? I think it would be love. Love? Very good. Thank you. Love one another. Loving one another? He had this perspective, this kind of big picture perspective, didn't he? And I don't know how to describe that in a value either. You know? But he had this perspective that God is bigger than petty jealousies of brothers. And what God allowed to happen has now been used. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's a good thing Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery or else they'd have never been able to do that. I think not. I think God could have gotten Joseph to Egypt some other way. But the fact that his brothers did that did not stop God from being able to protect the survival of his people that he had chosen. And this is a message that, that is just germane to our families. To see God's power and God's purposes, even in the events of men, that the schemes of man do not thwart the purposes of God. Well, tomorrow, at this time, we're going to be looking at some uh, real specifics on how to transmit values to the next generation. And I'm hoping that, that some of you that have older children will be here to share in some of the things that you have noticed have helped to transmit those values. So I'll be looking forward to being with you again tomorrow at 11.15. Uh, yeah. Thank you.